Good afternoon, guests, and welcome to The Weekly with Dr. Tom. This is your way to stay up to date with everything healthcare related across the country. This week, we'll be joined by Dr. Trisha Tang to discuss everything diabetes, COVID, and mental health related. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the seminar. Submit your questions throughout by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We look forward to your engagement throughout the program. Now, here's Dr. Tom. Good afternoon, viewers. I trust you've all had a good week. We've had a very busy one at BC Diabetes with virtual care continuing with visits by Zoom calls and regular telephone. A big thanks to you all at home and my staff also working from home, adapting to everything so well. Things are ever so slowly returning to normal. Our staff has started to see research patients in person for essential visits. We will begin to see regular non-research clients in the coming weeks and keep you updated. Thanks to our COVID-19 task force led by Dr. Arthur Weisinger, we have a protocol in place to ensure your safety as well as that of our staff. Today's focus is on diabetes and mental health. Mental health, like physical health, is something we all want to preserve and where necessary, improve. Preserving one's sanity during COVID-19 is a topic to which I think everybody can relate. We are privileged to have Dr. Tricia Tang as our guest and topic expert this week. Dr. Tang is world renowned in the field of diabetes associated distress and depression. I've gotten to know Tricia very well professionally and personally since she and her husband moved from Ann Arbor, Michigan a decade ago to join the UBC Faculty of Medicine in her case. Tricia and I have had an extensive collaboration that has benefited all of you in one way or another. How, you might ask? Well, Tricia helped design the Head Start study that showed that the use of case managers in diabetes care gave much better outcomes when you had only an endocrinologist like me. Not only did, we improve, did, did case management improve A1C and diet and exercise, but importantly, it lowered diabetes distress. Tricia is part of our mindfulness study, which is examining whether the use of the meditation app Headspace improves various diabetes outcomes, including diabetes distress. I've said enough. Tricia, welcome to the weekly. Thanks, Dr. Elliot. I'm gonna keep calling you Dr. Elliot because that is what is part of what I do. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Trisha Tang and I wanna welcome you to my home office. Um, I wanna thank BC Diabetes for inviting me to be a guest speaker on your show today. I'm gonna to be talking about coping with COVID um, in isolation as well as um, issues related to mental health and um, um, how it you know, particularly impacts folks with diabetes type one and type two. Um, and let me start a little about myself. I am, as uh, Dr. Elliot said, an associate professor in the division of endocrinology. I'm trained as a clinical psychologist and a behavioral scientist with an expertise in diabetes. And there are only three of us with that specific professional background in Canada. And it's not because I'm special. Um, it's because that this area of training, diabetes and mental health, is an area of training that is much more common in the United States than it is in Canada. Um, but JDRF is working to change that and they are um, sponsoring other training opportunities for people who are interested in psychology and diabetes. So in the research setting, I design and test interventions to help people with type one and type two make lifestyle changes. I also um, design interventions to help reduce diabetes distress and improve mental health. Uh, in the clinical setting, I do almost the same exact thing, except for I work exclusively um, with type one. And the reason I do is just because these are the people who are being referred to me by the endocrinologists in our division. So last September, I uh, started an organization called the T1D Huddle. And the Huddle is really just a home base for adults with T1D who are looking for psychosocial support but can't afford it. And as you all probably know, in British Columbia, the public health plan doesn't cover psychology. It doesn't cover counseling that's associated 
with chronic illness like diabetes. Um, and that's really not right um, and not very Canadian, but that's a topic for another discussion. Um, so every month I lead a face-to-face -face session at either St. Paul's or um, Roundhouse Community Center. Uh, and we have people share experiences, um, learn from each other. They're not there to see me. They're actually there to see other people because I think you learn the most from other adults with T1T. Um, these sessions have moved online um, because it, uh, obviously, because of the COVID situation. So I invite um, people, again, this actually is for more for type one. Um, now back to the focus of the session. I know in the past six weeks, things have been really challenging and difficult um, with the isolation, not really letting up, um, not being able to interact with anyone who is not living under the same roof as you. And when you do go out, having to maintain this kind of six foot personal puzzle all the time. Um, and we don't, um, you know, as Dr. Elliot said, it is going to change eventually, but right now we have to keep coping with all these restrictions. Um, you know, one good thing is because of all the personal sacrifices that we've made, we are seeing really great numbers in BC um, compared to other provinces in Canada and obviously compared to the United States. So I do want to tell you that your personal sacrifice is making a huge difference. So if we can keep it up, that will help our province as a whole. So how do we keep it up? How do we stay sane, as Dr. Elliot had said? Um, I want to talk about some strategies of coping with isolation, um, and I want to structure it by using this coping with COVID, um, the 10 commandments. It's kind of facetious, but I just thought it was cute. All right, so I'm going to do this. Um, Luke has already projected the actual whole document, the 10 commandments, but I'm going to walk through it using my low-tech methods. Um, I'm a low-tech woman in a high-tech world. All right, so the first commandment is stay connected. It's really important to keep your relationships going. I know um, a lot of times people, um, you know, in, even introverts need interaction with the outside world. One of my friends who um, is one of a uh, social butterfly, she was uh, joking and saying, reach out to your extroverted friends that are really suffering at this time, which is true. Um, maybe you want to try some strategies like, you know, choosing one of your closest friends or family member and doing a daily check-in, either in the morning, asking, okay, what's your schedule like today? Or doing a daily check-in at night, right before you go to sleep. So what did you do today? Having that daily interaction and knowing it's there for you is really important. Um, again, we have the monthly T1D huddles where at least 40 to 45 other adults with T1D around BC and other provinces actually come in and listen um, to an expert just like this show. Um, and that's a great way to connect with the um, diabetes community. And we also have other ways of connecting on a daily basis like peer-to-peer -peer messaging. So number two, go outside at least once a day. So I know in the beginning of COVID, everyone was really scared about should we be going outside? If we go outside, what do we do? Um, but you know, as Dot, uh, Bonnie Henry has told us, um, it's okay to go outside. We encourage you to go outside as long as you stay safe. You know, wash your hands. Um, when you sneeze, sneeze into your elbow. Um, just keep that six foot personal bubble around you. So those are all things that as long as you take those precautions, um, you are going to be safe and there's no reason to be really frightened or scared. Um, fresh air is like carbohydrates for the soul. Without it, I think people wilt. Um, and it gives you that charge and the energy to stay excited and enthusiastic about the day. So I think it's important, again, to just walk outside the door at least once a day. All right, number three, recognize and label your feelings. So it's okay to feel angry, frustrated. Most likely what we're feeling a lot is bored, like just bored out of our mind. And again, that's, that's fine to feel those ways and accept it. It's not until you label exactly what you're feeling. Um, are you depressed? Are you anxious? Because then that, that helps us decide, well, how are you going to address it? Um, if you are depressed and sad, we might want to implement something called activity scheduling. All that is is, kind of making appointments in your day to do things that are you're able to do, minimal pleasurable things like taking a walk around the block. 
Um, and the premise is that if you do something like that, you, you'll feel this you know, positive reinforcement of getting fresh air, and that makes you want to take a walk the next day. So those are some of the things that you, we can do when we talk about depression and sadness. Um, there are other things that are a little bit more extensive, like cognitive restructuring. Sometimes the way we think um, helps um, or leads us to spiral into kind of a negative direction. And so cognitive restructuring is taking the way that we think, figuring out what's going on, what our patterns are, and then kind of um, tweaking it, switching it so that when we think, um, we think in better patterns and that will improve our mood and improve our quality of life. Um, if you're anxious, um, as Dr. Elliot had mentioned, he has, um, or we have a new a study called the Mindfulness Headspace app. And this, um, what we're testing is, if you have access to this app and you use it, um, will your quality of life be better? Will your, um, will your depression symptoms mitigate? Will your mood improve? So the great thing about research studies is you participate for free. And oftentimes you actually do get an incentive. And so people who really can't afford the Headspace app, they actually can get it for free. So again, that is something where if you're anxious or frustrated, mindfulness and meditation, those are things that are probably going to be more effective. All right, so number four, draw on your personal strengths. So we all have um, different ways of coping with things and some of them are healthy, like maybe taking a run if you're stressed and some of them are unhealthy, maybe like you know eating a pint of Ben and Jerry's. So I'm gonna challenge you to work on some of the ones that are more healthy that you do, but also experiment with some strategies that you haven't done yet. So I think you probably have heard on the news um, that you know, people are doing a lot more baking. So when you go to a store, there's no flour because people are baking bread, sourdough, this and that. They're baking muffins, cupcakes. Um, other people are experimenting with other things like cooking. Um, there's a puzzle shortage in the world because everyone's buying puzzles and making these like gigantic puzzles that take a week. So again, that is something that um, is a great coping strategy because it is kind of meditative as well. So again, think about things that you already naturally like um, and then you know, transform it into a coping strategy for you. All right, so, um, and of course, mindfulness, meditation, yoga, um, those are some more common strategies that people use. Um, so, you know, try something you haven't done. If you haven't done that, just see if you like it. Um, there are some many different types out there, and they're all free. Uh, I mean, the t there are different free types, but and you can experiment, and you might like something more than another. All right, so number five, create social experiences. Again, this has to do with the same thing as staying connected. We need to feel like we're around people, even though we can't actually be physically around them. So what are some creative ways? Um, again, because this isolation period has been going on for six weeks, you know, most people have kind of already picked up these um, tips. And one is, you know, doing happy hours at five with your work friends, um, uh, playing games uh, like Trivial Pursuit with a whole bunch of family members on Zoom, um, having a tea party if you have young kids, maybe inviting all your kids' friends over for a tea party, dressing up, um, and you know, actually everyone making their own little dish. Um, those are things that um, will make things a little bit more uh, bright and happy in the day. Um, I have a friend who is a 12 year old, oh, 12, um, but she and her friends from eight o'clock to 12 o'clock, they use this app called House Party and they just leave it on literally for four hours. And they act as if like, they're just doing their own thing. Everyone knows what each other's doing. And it feels like you're in the same room, you're in the same house. Um, so again, I think at different ages, we have different kind of creative ideas, but I really encourage you to think about some things that are gonna be um, really fun for you. Okay, so, oh, this one's important. Stay active, okay. So I think one of the most challenging things right now is that everything's closed. So obviously gyms, fitness centers, all those um, places that you, you know, a lot of people are accustomed to going to, to exercise are closed. So we have to find more creative ways. Going outside, yeah, that's a great idea, but 
we know that Vancouver rains a lot. So what are some other ways that you can stay active? Um, I think a lot of different um, organizations have put up uh, free yoga, free Zumba lessons, all these different things that you can get free. So again, I recommend that you um, experiment with this. Um, I have two research studies where we created free Bhangra videos. Bhangra is just like Bollywood aerobics um, and videos that um, people can use for free and trying out a new way of dancing. Um, you know, one thing I've always said is that um, it's hard to be motivated to do something when you feel really kind of restricted. Um, so, you know, something is better than nothing. So walking, going outside, walking one block and back is better than walking no blocks and black back. So times that I really feel tired, um, I can still walk, you know, a quarter of a mile. I don't have to walk fast, but something is always better than nothing when it comes to exercise and staying active. Okay, number six, yeah, number seven, build structure into your day. Um, I when, when COVID first started, I think people really didn't know what to do. They were just getting up at certain times, anytime, um, and days were boring into each other. And I think one of the things that we want to do to keep sane is to create that structure. You know, decide, are you going to wake up at eight o'clock every day, then brush your teeth, then have breakfast, then you're going to work from, um, what, 10 to 12, take a break. Having, it's kind of like the activity scheduling thing. If you also have a structure of your day, you have a goal, you have the next goal to work towards, um, and you have a purpose, meaning. I, I have a friend whose son, who is a teenager, um, they, he started just, you know, goes to sleep at two in the morning, and then, you know, uh, wakes up really late. And, and it's just, again, that one day blurring into an, another makes us feel like we're, we don't have any goals or objectives to work to. So structure is important. Ask for help. Um, okay, so help. Um, we're all out there and you can, there are all, mental health help, definitely you can call um, the different organizations, but just asking help from your friends. Um, we had, uh, we have two friends who came back from um, traveling Japan and Australia, all these other countries. This is early on in COVID. So when they came back, they had to be isolated for 14 days. Um, and you know, they couldn't leave the house. And so they called us and said, hey, will you do us a favor and get some groceries for us? So it's okay again, your friends are there to help you um, for the littlest things or even big things, just they're there and call on them when you just need a little assistance. Okay, um, number nine, remain attentive to your management. So obviously, um, you know, with our changes in exercise, um, people are gonna be eating more junk food. Um, all these patterns of what we do every day, they're shifting. And sometimes they're shifting in the negative direction. So your blood sugars are gonna be really kind of out of whack. Um, and so this is what Jerry Klein, one of my colleagues has drilled into my head, check and correct, check and correct. So maybe because you know that things are unpredictable, you wanna check more. And then when you check and your numbers are not where they should be, correct. So I always just remember that check and correct, check and correct. Um, treat it as if you would be treating managing a sick day. Okay. And finally, number 10, um, rely on accurate information, trusted resources like Dr. Bonnie Henry. I think um, we all have seen the example in the United States where injecting yourself with Lysol is not the way to go. Um, and, and, you know, I have, I taught a med, uh, med school class about a month ago. And one of my students whose parents lived in a different country, um, they were hearing things like uh, COVID was airborne for, and it stays in the air for eight hours. So her parents had stayed in the house for two months when they really didn't have to. So again, if you're gonna listen to the news, one, don't, don't you know, perseverate and listen you know, every second of the day, just listen to it once a day, but listen to the people you know are trustworthy. Um, like Dr. Bonnie Henry, like our um, Adrian Dix. Okay, so those are my 10 tips. Um, Dr. Elliot, did you, well, have, do you have any questions? Um, can I just, uh, one sec, I just need to turn off something because it's beeping, so it's not distracting. I'll be right back, you can talk. Well, thanks Dr. Tang. We're gonna go to some Q&A now. 
Dr. Elliot, Spencer asks, I have trouble staying motivated to exercise. I start out well, but after a few weeks, I start losing early enthusiasm. Any recommendations? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, can, you, can you repeat that? I had to just turn off this beeping sound in my house. You know, Tricia, it was a question from Spencer for me, but, but, but oh, sorry. I would welcome you to answer it as well. Spencer wants to know, he's, he's losing his discipline around exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, what can you do about... My quick answer to you, Spencer, is it's medicine. Like all these things, all the 10 points that Tricia gave you, Dr. Tang gave you, they're medicine. The more of them you do, you do, the better you'll be. And exercise with, I mean, obviously you can exercise too much, but think of it as medicine. You don't have to like it. You don't have to enjoy it. But interestingly, I think you will learn to enjoy it the more used to it you get. Tricia, anything to add? Yeah, you know, um, as I said, it's easy to lose motivation right now, really easy, because even if you're going outside to exercise, you can't really go anywhere. You can't run to a coffee shop, go and get something, come back. Um, so give yourself permission. It's okay if you're feeling less motivated than you used to, but remember, something is better than nothing. And so if that means that, okay, you're not motivated to exercise like you used to, what are you willing to do and what can you feasibly do? Um, can you walk around the block um, once or twice? If you think that you could do it, it might be a little challenging, but you can do it, then do that first. And then do that for a day, do that for two days. And if you feel like, wow, yeah, that, that worked, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I can do that, then add one more block. So don't, give yourself a break because we're all losing motivation. But again, something is better than nothing. So walking, you know, 100 yards is better than walking no yards. And um, the other thing is being creative. So, you know, if you want to um, exercise with a friend, have FaceTime on, do a walk um, and, and just talk together. Um, those types of things. Oh, it, you know, again, there's a lot of free exercise videos on um, television or on, you know, on, on the internet. So you can experiment with those. Um, there's so many different kinds. It's not all just yoga and Zumba. There's, you know, um, high intensity training. So again, just figure out um, something you like, but try to experiment with things and think of it always as an experiment. You don't have to do it. Let's just see how it is. If you don't like it, great. We know that we don't, you don't like that video. Try a different one. Thanks, Dr. Tang. We're gonna have a quick break from Q&A and briefly update you on what's happening with COVID-19 at VGH and then to Dr. Samuel for something a bit more than hand washing today. Dr. Elliot, to you. Thank you, Tristan. Um, viewers, you will recall uh, Dr. Don Grisdale's uh, at our, our, I think it was our second weekly, uh, Don, you'll remember, was the, is the, medical director of the VGH ICU, and he told us how the frontliners were staying safe. He also reassured us that there was lots of capacity and that continues to be the case. What I'm sharing with you here is uh, a slide taken from a daily briefing I get from Vancouver Coastal about what's happening. And this, this particular slide here looks at admissions to VGH in the last six weeks for COVID-19. The light blue is hospital in general, the dark blue is the ICU. You can see starting in mid-March, starting in mid-March, we got the, it started to rise, and then by the end of March, it had peaked, and then it fell off. What I want to draw your attention to is the blip that occurred in the last couple of weeks. This is the blip that Dr. Henry's telling us about. We have to be eternally vigilant in our daily practices, in our social distancing and other things. And with that, I'm going to take you to Dr. Praveen Samuel, who I understand is going to talk about more than just hand washing. Thank you, Dr. Elliot. Today, we're going to talk about masks. BC Diabetes recommends to all the staff and patients that they wear a surgical, surgical mask when they leave their own homes. Now, there are mainly two uses for why you should do this. It reduces transmission of COVID-19, and it helps you avoid touching your face, which is the most common method 
of acquiring COVID-19. For the general public, the humble surgical mask is enough. You don't need an N95 mask unless you're a healthcare worker or caring for a family member who has COVID-19 and is confined to your home. I hope you have now learned by now, uh, by now the proper hand washing technique. Because before you wear a mask, you need to make sure that your hands are safe and clean. After you've washed your hands, take the surgical mask out of its package. I'd like to draw your attention to this mask here. It has three layers, the outer colored layer, the inner white layer, and a, a layer that you can't see in the middle that has the filter. The top of the mask has a, has a metallic wire, which you're going to use to contour the mask according to the shape of your face. If you're wearing glasses, take off your glasses. Place the mask on your face. Contour the metallic wire according to the shape of your face. Pull each loop behind your ears. Adjust the mask and pull it down. These masks are single use masks. When do you remove them? When they become soiled or wet. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Elliot. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Praveen. Um, I, I think we're getting back into Q&A, Tricia. And I, I have one for you. Um, I, I was trying to keep track of all those 10 recommendations. They're fantastic. And they seem so sensible. For some reason, I thought this was going to be deep and deep and dark and mysterious, but, but that's clearly not the case. What, what about House Party? What's this House Party app? So I think House Party was developed for teenagers, um, where again, like every, you have got, you know, six friends on at the same time. It's really kind of no different than um, FaceTime, except for there are games that are integrated into it. So you can play Trivial Pursuit while you're on House Party. Um, people can join the party, leave the party. Um, if you're on House Party, then it, like, so for example, my friend Chris, when he's on it with some of his friends, I get a notification and it says, Chris is in the house and do I want to join his house party right now? So I think it's just really fun. It's a fun way to keep connected. And even though it was made for teenagers, I think in, you know, right now, it's uh, one mechanism to stay connected. So, um, and it's free. I mean, there, there's no cost to it. Thanks, Dr. Tang. The next question is from Fernando for Dr. Elliot. Regarding meditation and type one diabetes, any comments on how to have compassion for self when I feel we often judge ourselves for not always being on the ball? I understand we don't have control over so many factors affecting our diabetes management, but sometimes avoidance is the easiest thing to do. Any tips? Well, that is like the world's biggest question. That's, that's like a, that's the, a lifetime spiritual journey. Um, being kind to yourself, you know, um, I think there's, there's very little point in looking back other than not making the same mistakes again. So if, if we assume we're doing that, then, then, then forgive yourself just like you should forgive everybody else and just make good choices. Um, and, and, and those are the, you know, the 10 things that Dr. Tang has mentioned are all, are all right there in the zone. Um, yeah, let's look, let's, let's look forward. And um, yeah, uh, Tricia? You know, um, I agree with you, Dr. Elliot. Um, you know, we all have good days and bad days. And I think uh, what I was saying about this idea of negative patterns of thinking, um, I think for folks who are more likely or susceptible to feeling depressed, they have the kind of thinking of where they're focusing on all the bad days. Um, so no one's perfect. So if you feel like your blood sugar, you know, spiked up because you had a piece of pizza, think about a day that you were really, you know, that you're really attentive to your diet, you did really well. And so again, focusing on that balance is gonna help you give um, yourself a little leeway to be human. I mean, there's no one, I mean, I've worked with, uh, Dr. Elliot's worked with thousands and thousands of patients. I can promise you, 
there is not one person we've ever met who has kept their blood sugar in range 100% of the time every single day. Everyone has variation. So if you think of it that way, you're no different than everyone else. So why do you think you're gonna, you're gonna be better than everyone else? It, you, being normal means that you're gonna have ups and downs. Um, but for every down, think, a think of a time that you had an up. Thanks, Dr. Tang. The next question is from Paul. You mentioned to go outside at least once a day. How long do you recommend I should stay outside each time? So again, if you're feeling unmotivated, then I would recommend just go outside for a second. But if you're feeling, you know, if you feel like that motivation is increasing day by day, um, I think what they say is doing anything in 10 minute bouts is most effective. So of course, if you can run for 30 minutes, we, we would love you to run for 30 minutes, keep your heart rate up. But if that's something that is completely not you know, feasible, you, can, you know that's not what you're gonna do, then work towards that 10 minutes of keeping your heart rate up. I think what's important, you know, again, walking is great, um, but when you feel like you can do a little more, keep doing a little more and adding more minutes or adding, you know, adding something that your, your heart is going to, your heart rate's gonna go up. But again, it's a gradual process, so don't set a goal that you can't meet because then you're going to feel bad. Um, set a goal where you think, you know what, you know, I haven't done that before, but I can see myself, I can visualize, visualize myself doing it, and that's the goal you want to set. And the next day, um, and the next day, you're going to, um, that goal is going to shift and you're going to do six months, minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes, um, but really, really start out gradual. Um, you don't want to set yourself up for failure. Thanks, Dr. Tang. Dr. Elliott, I think we're going to go to you for a little meditation. Oh, yes. Um, we, we keep talking about mindfulness and meditation, and I thought I'd just share a bit of my own experience. Um, I've had a daily meditation practice with the secular Headspace app for the last five years. I say secular to remind me that many of you have your own spiritual practices in which I believe prayer serves the same purpose and probably much more. I consider prayer and prayerfulness to be akin to meditation. So when I say meditation, please feel free to substitute the word prayer. So helpful did I find my, the meditation in my own life that I incorporated it into the mindfulness clinical trial of BC diabetes. If you're interested about it, please talk to your case manager. A couple of words about what, what I do. I do it first thing in the morning after my push-ups. By the way, my push-ups are my reward to have coffee. So if I don't do my push-ups, I can't do my coffee. If I don't do my meditation, I can't do my piano practice or whatever. Anyway, I find a quiet place and I sit upright, relaxed, but with good posture, not in the lotus position because my knees don't let me. And then I follow the instructions from the Headspace app. Luke, our producer, is now going to play the first minute of an introductory guided meditation led by Andy, the voice from Headspace. After that, we'll go back to Q&A with Dr. Tang. So just making sure that you're sitting comfortably, we're going to start with the eyes open. Just taking a moment to pause, to take in the space around you. And then when you're ready, just taking a big deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. In fact, just take a couple of breaths like that aware of the body expanding as it takes in the air and of the muscles softening as you exhale. Okay. And with the next out breath. Just gently closing the eyes. And as you feel the body press down into the seat beneath you, feet connecting with the ground. Just taking a moment to enjoy that feeling of having stopped, having nothing to do for a few moments. That's the end of the demo. It goes, that particular one goes for five minutes. I do a 20 minute meditation. 
Okay, fantastic. Now back to the Q&A. We've had a number of people ask about this. This particular question is from George. Obviously in our demo, we used a surgical mask. Not everyone from the public can get them. Can you talk about the difference between surgical masks and homemade masks, Dr. Elliot? I'm gonna to defer to Dr. Samuel on that. Um, thank you, Dr. Elliot. Surgical masks are your best bet, but if they're not readily available at your home or you have difficulty in, in acquiring them, then you can use a, a self-make cloth mask at home. And we will be doing a segment on other kinds of masks in future, um, the weekly shows. What about the N95? What's that and who uses that? Yes, so the N95 masks, you don't need to use them unless you're a healthcare worker or you're caring for a family member or any other individual who has COVID-19 and is confined to the space of their home or your home. So I think, I hope that answers the question. You know, bandanas are, are very useful. They're easy to make. There's, there are umpteen YouTube videos on how to make one at home. I think we, in one of our earlier shows, we, we had one making it out of uh, some paper towels. So that's all you really need to do. You don't need to go and spend a lot of money. You don't need to go on Amazon. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. We have a question from Lydia for Dr. Tang. I think my mental health is suffering because I can't visit my mom at her care home. Any suggestions on how I can overcome this? I totally understand why you feel that way. Um, it's hard to be, not be around family members and not have that closeness. Um, I'm not sure if you're allowed to actually be outside of the building and see her, but if not, um, if you have Zoom, if you have Skype, um, I'm trying to think of the mechanisms of um, virtual communication, that's free, and I think there's Skype and FaceTime. Um, Zoom usually is not, um, but using those mechanisms to communicate um, having, if your mom is older and she's not accustomed to technology, like me, I'm, I feel like I'm a, di a dinosaur and my students are the ones who help me with it. Um, ask um, a nurse who works in that building to help her set it up. Once you set it up once, you know exactly what to do. Um, you know, just like this talk, this, this show right now, this session, I feel like I see Dr. Elliot, I see Tristan. It, it feels a lot more connected than um, there are some of um, the folks who are participating who has who have decided not to put on their video, and that's fine, totally fine. But um, I realized that I hated doing FaceTime when I was um, before COVID. I didn't like having my face projected. Um, but because COVID happened, um, and I teach medical students, and so I had to use these video conferencing options, I did actually realize that it's a way to feel closer and it's not the same as face-to-face -face, but it's the next best thing so if it's possible for you to use one of these video conferencing mechanisms and have someone teach your mom how to use it just once um, i think that'll make a difference thanks dr tang the next question is from mary to dr elliot Oh, can, I just say one, uh, can I just say one more thing? I'm sorry. Um, it just reminded me of, um, so my husband's parents, they live in Oregon um, and they're in a nursing home. And what he did was he bought one of these picture frames, these um, uh, electric picture frames where from Vancouver, he can load on pictures, new pictures every, every day. And then it projects onto their little picture frame in Oregon. So every day you can show different pictures of what's happening, what we're doing. And so again, that's another way um, that your, your mom doesn't have to need to know how to do you know, tech. You can just um, have someone set it up for her. And that's a way of keeping connected every single day. Sorry, Tristan. Not a problem. Thanks, Dr. Tang. The next question is for Dr. Elliot from Mary. With the expected loosening of current recommendations by the Ministry of Health, we expect to return to work at some point in May. We directly interact with clients and social distancing of two meters is not possible. Can you give us specific guidelines within this setting for safety precautions for diabetics? Are we considered immunocompromised? If we have a choice, should we maintain working from home remotely? Thank you, Mary, fantastic question. So number one, yes, if you can work from home remotely, 
and be as productive and keep your boss happy, then that's definitely what you should do until all restrictions are raised. Um, you know, we're facing the same kinds of questions at BC Diabetes as we open up. And we, we have a task force and I actually reviewed their draft, the draft recommendations this morning and I believe they're actually ready for prime time. Um, and, and we will actually post them on our website. So if you go to bcdiabetes.ca slash handouts um, and type in COVID, a whole bunch of topics will come up. One of them will be work protocols. Um, I can tell you what we do. So if, if, you can't be, if you can't be more than two meters away, that's why you wear a mask. You know, if someone coughs or sneezes or anything, it's not that you're going to be immune from that cough or sneeze, but it's going to improve your odds. Number one, wear a mask stick to hand washing. Um, our protocol at, at BC Diabetes uh, means that when we meet people in the elevator, if they don't have a mask, we give them one. If they haven't washed, we make them wash our hands in front of our eyes. They come up to the office. Um, we, we're, we're of course wearing a mask as well. And then after they've left, we clean off the seat or the the examining room table, if we haven't had paper, disposable paper, we clean it off with isopropyl alcohol, 70%. You could use a, a weak solution of Lysol yourself. So those things will kill the virus on surfaces left, just in case this person has the virus and isn't sick. And then wearing a mask, of course, is, is powerful. So these are basic things we can do which will improve our odds, and that's what we're doing at BC Diabetes. Thanks, Dr. Elliott. At this point, we'd like to announce that BC Diabetes Institute is offering a new program to patients who struggle with weight and stress management. The customized curriculum will allow participants to access resources, listen to professionals, and work together to, to reach their unique goals. The first virtual session will be tomorrow at 10 a.m. This program will run weekly on Fridays so progress can be tracked. Let us know if you'd like to enter by calling or emailing our office. Now back to the questions. Dr. Tang, Mary is wondering, how did you come up with the Headspace study? Um, that actually is not my study. It's Dr. Elliott's study. I helped him with it. Um, I'm a co-investigator, but I would say I would defer to Dr. Elliott. He's the one who um, you know, came up with this idea, which I think is fantastic. Oh. Well, well, Mary, you know, as I mentioned, I found meditation, you know, there's a million different ways of meditating in prayer, et cetera. I, I chose Headspace. We did some research and Dr. Weisinger, who we're going to have as one of our guests, he researched everything on the internet. He reviewed 100 different programs and Headspace was the clear winner. Um, it improved my life so greatly that I thought maybe it'll help everybody else. And uh, we, we did a little pilot study. We gave it to four or five patients and they loved it. And then um, we wrote the protocol. And of course, we needed Dr. Tang to make sure that it, it met uh, scientific scrutiny uh, because psychology is not my field. And that's, that's how and why we did the study. Okay. The next question is for Dr. Tang. Why doesn't the BC Health Plan cover chronic illness counseling or psychology? How harmful do you think this is? Does it affect diabetics, especially hard? So I'm from the United States originally. And so when I came to Canada and you know, for a month experienced all of the different healthcare opportunities, um, I just thought in every single way, Canada is better than the States, but one, and that's mental health. I, you know, honestly, I'm not, um, I mean, I can guess the reason they don't cover mental health is because it costs a lot of money. So they, you know, it, it's money saving if, mental health is not integrated in part of the public plan. Um, only um, ex people who have extended healthcare like Sun Life, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, they all have different plans. Some of them is like 20 se sessions or this much money. Um, so we already know, with diabetes especially, we already know that diabetes distress is linked, tightly linked with worse A1C. Um, and then we, you know, this, this literature is also growing where, you know, diabetes distress is related to poor eating habits, to lower exercise levels, to, you know, um, higher blood pressure. 
Um, and when we look at other research that looks at, you know, um, perspectively, all that means is does it predict things? And it actually does predict um, a higher mortality rate. So what we're trying to do, um, Dr. Elliot and I, is we're trying to do research studies that produce evidence to show that if you treat diabetes and stress, if you offer psychological help, it actually saves money in the long run. Um, but a, a lot of evidence has to be collected before um, the Ministry of Health and um, other bodies, governing bodies, are willing to make a change that costs money. Dr. Elliot, you're much more political than I am. Am I saying the right things? You are saying all the right things. And, and you know, viewers and, and Dr. Tang, you are aware that, that, that Adrian Dix, our, our Minister of Health, who's doing such an amazing job during COVID-19, is also has type one and is also our client. So um, Adrian, can we just add that to the list? Um, and, you know, Tricia, we need to set up a, a, a task force to, to push that agenda. So, um, Kristen, I just wanted to follow up, you know, um, of the research out there in Canada about diabetes distress, most of it has been conducted in Ontario. Um, we actually just did a study that we're going to um, submit soon, looking at 58 adults with type 1. Um, and we weren't looking for this. We were just, you know, having people complete a diabetes distress scale. But what we found is that people who have um, only MSP and no extended health care, that is associated with lower management distress and physician distress. So again, that's the kind of evidence that we need more of in order to push and um, you know, trigger a change in the Ministry of Health. Excellent. Now, Dr. Elliott, I understand you have a question that you'd like to ask Dr. Tang. Yes, Tricia. Um... I, I'm hopeless at art and I'm not very good at music, but I do love my piano lessons and it makes me feel better. Can you tell us about that amazing piece behind you and, and then talk about art therapy in general, in general as, a, as a treatment for distress? Yes, definitely. Um, so my husband, his older sister um, is a quilter. She's a professional, I want to say professional, she does it as a hobby, but she is one of the best quilters in the world. Um, and in fact, she had a um, exhibition at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. So behind me is one of her quilts. Um, most of her quilts are a little bit more traditional. This is the only quilt that, um, I, you know, that she's made that are, is really contemporary, like pops and is bright. And so I love this quilt and she was gracious enough to give it to me as a present. So that, that is um, her. Uh, Art and being creative, those are things that are so important um, to make sure you feel, you know, I'll say on air quotes, you're, you remain sane. I mentioned people are cooking more, um, you know, piano lessons. Like if you teach piano lessons to little kids on the internet, I'm, again, that will be solving two problems. You know, I think parents are struggling with trying to get their kids to be able to um, do things within the home. You can do that. Uh, I have one person who is part of T uh, the T1D Huddle where she rented um, a pottery wheel from the local pottery um, you know, shop, or not the shop, but a studio, because the pottery studio was closed, so they're not going to be using it. So they rented out you know, pottery, um, you know, their pottery wheels, things like that. Like, there's a lot of things you can do um, that either cost no money or um, you know, not much money, um, but being creative, um, and whatever outlet that is, whether it's art, whether it's music, whether it's cooking, um, is really important to stay enthusiastic and, um, you know, stay sane. Thanks, Dr. Tang. Before Tom's closing monologue, we have one last question. It's from Donald. How much do you think mental health affects diabetes care, Dr. Elliot? Well, it, it's colossal. Well, Dr. Tang has already spoken about one of the BC Diabetes case managers, Jerry Klein. Jerry, Jerry is a nurse by training. She's our only nurse. She has a master's and she's certified by Diabetes Canada, etc. cetera. Um, Jerry specializes in helping people who fall through the cracks. And, and if, if you look at the people who fall through the cracks, it's, it's poverty, it's, it's lack of education, 
Um, but more than anything else, it's mental health issues. So for, you know, if I were, if I were Minister Dix and the, and, and, and the Minister of Finance, I, I, would, I know how much mental health costs the province. And if, and, and if you add diabetes to that, it's, it's a big deal. So it's, uh, it's a huge topic. Um, and, you know, as, as we, I think, Tricia, this is our fifth, the weekly, and, and I, I keep getting more ideas about, you know, about where we should go with it. Um, we have the polling, which is wonderful. Luke, can you run a quick poll asking how many people want to do um, music therapy or art therapy um, during COVID? Anyway, Tristan, I, I know that we have a schedule to, to stick to. Is that me? Is it my monologue now? Thanks, Dr. Lee. Yes, please give us your closing monologue. Okay. Well, I, I want to thank our guest, uh, Dr. Tricia Tang. Tricia, it's been it's been a wonderful it's been wonderful having you. I feel like I've usually I think that, that this is for my patients. I feel like it's for me. So I I, I feel lighter and I got more ideas. Uh, and we thank you very much. A round of applause from everybody. Thank you for coming, Tricia. Um, next week. We're going to continue with, uh, with diet. And given that last week was on part one of diabetes and technology, where we talked about CGM, it became very obvious that diet hugely affects our sugar. And what we're going to do next Thursday is talk about um, fasting to help us decide how much long acting insulin we need or whether we need to go from pills to insulin. And then we've got Lana, our dietitian, coming back to talk about carb counting in a sensible way. Lana, Lana's not super strict. She's, she's smart and sensible. And so that's what we're going to do next week. We're going to help you decide whether you need to move from pills to insulin. If you're on insulin, whether you've got the dose of long acting insulin, right. And if you're on fast insulin, telling you how to count your carbs to guide your insulin doses. At this point, we'd like to say a big thank you to Dr. Tricia Tang, all of our partners, and you, our beloved audience. See you next week and have a lovely weekend.